This coming April, we want to invite you to our annual Passover celebration event. From bonfires to ice cream socials to incredible worship and timeless symbolism of the Seder meal itself, this event is free and we want you to be there. So text PASSOVER2024 to 844-763-9543 for more info or go to passionforpassover.com. I'll see you there. All right, turn with me to Exodus chapter 25. 25, let's talk about that journey into the Holy of Holies, which is going to bring us into a deeper walk with God, a deeper understanding of God, and a really a deeper understanding of love. I'm a, I'm a protocol guy. I'm a firstborn alpha type of CEO mentality. I think in logistics. I think in steps. I think of how do I get the football down the, to the end zone what are the plays that I got to do to get there? If you own a business, uh, and I did for many years before I was in ministry, and ministry is just another business. It's just God's business, right? You cannot have, I've got nine current employees. Before PFT 1.0, I had 22 employees. And you cannot have a larger organization without some sort of boundaries, some sort of, of rules, instructions. In Hebrew, we call that Torah, Torah. You can't have uh, anything successful that doesn't have protocol, right? How many have uh, more than one child? Raise your hand, okay? So you understand, you gotta have a Torah in your house. You gotta have boundaries, you gotta have protocols. If you don't, it's chaos, right? And so th the, the dance of life is to figure out if I wanna raise successful children, what are, the, what are the steps to do that? What's the protocol to do that? How do I do that? If you don't have a plan, you will make it up as you go, all right? And most of us would do that, and we don't tell our kids that we just thought of it right now, or whatever the rule is. But it, we need to be intentional. Say intentional. Okay, the reason why you're going to hear that word over and over and over again if you follow me on social media is because this is the prophetic word that God gave me right before 2024 started. I was in prayer one day, and he told me, Jim, be intentional. Intentional is the word for 2024. He wants his people to stop being led by every wind of doctrine. And by the way, wind of doctrine that's not of God is another wind. Amen? And there's only one other entity in this universe that's breathing right now that has the capability of breathing at that level, and that's Hasatan. We call him Satan in English. The adversary is breathing. Every one of us has a ship. That ship has a rudder, and it also has sails. So it's really nice to be out in the middle of the Caribbean and uh, enjoy the sunshine, enjoy the warmth, but at some point, being in the sunshine, being in the warmth is not going to get you anywhere. In order for you to get somewhere, you have to raise the sail. And if you want to raise the sail and you can blow on it because there's no wind out there, you're not going to go very far because you don't have enough breath. So there's two entities that know this. So when your sail goes up, the enemy sees it and God sees it. And you're the one that determine which ruach is going to hit your sail because it's going to go in the direction that the rudder that's pointing is pointing. And you are the deciding factor of where your ship goes. And so if you don't have a map, a GPS, a coordinate, a compass, in old school language, you're gonna find yourself in a different place than you actually deep down really expect. Has anybody ever experienced that? Okay, all of us have experienced that. And you end up in a place, you're like, man, I don't wanna be here, how did I get here? And some of you, the question you know, was, and maybe you're online uh, watching this later, but maybe the question was, how did I marry this person? You know, instead of how did I get here? And, and, and because people, are the restrictive force that the enemy uses to take you where he wants you to go. He uses emotion, he uses fear, and how many know he uses people really well, okay? And so the, the enemy knows this, that's his strategy, God has another strategy, we just don't know it. So I'm all about understanding steps, understanding protocols. What is the playbook? When the enemy is standing before me as a defensive line, and if I see this guy shift over here, I have a play for that. If you don't know what happens when that 
a defensive lineman moves or shifts, then you won't shift. Have you ever seen that football? It's fascinating. I'm not a massive football fan, but one guy shifts, and what's happening on the offensive team? They're shift. Everybody's shifting based on the offense. The defense is shifting based on the offense. So you are supposed to be on the offense, not the defense, and you have a play. For everything that the enemy is going to do, you have a play. And what we're going to talk about tonight is an ancient playbook that God has given us that, that most in Christianity don't even believe in because the enemy has convinced us that this playbook doesn't exist anymore. It's not relevant to you anymore. And what he did was he took the playbook for you to get a touchdown in your life and every category of your life out of your hands. And if you don't have the playbook, you'll never get into the, in, into the touchdown. But what he'll do so that you stay on the field and so he can keep beating you up more, he lets you come down the field, get some gain, you feel like you've done something, give you a first down here or there, and, and, then, and then push you so far back, and now it's, it's third and 42. And if you've ever been in the place where it's third and 42, that's a place where you begin to start feeling hopeless. Has anybody ever felt that some way sometimes? You're like, man, I just don't know if I, can, I can't do this anymore. That's when a wife will file a divorce. That's when a, when a husband will commit suicide or he starts going to the bar or he just gives up on leading his family because he feels constantly rejected and looked down upon by his spouse. I'm here to tell you that 3rd and 42, in the world they call it a Hail Mary, Right? Any Catholics in here? Former Catholics? Okay, right. I was an altar boy, actually. I was the guy that did the candles and little wafer thing, right? So if you come to my church, uh, I could, we, could, we could do that because I've been trained on how to give communion that way. Can you believe they still drink out of one chalice? I don't even understand that. How is the World Health Organization not all over? Anyway, <laughs> commercial. See, I do these rabbit trails, and then I forget where on earth I'm at. So, what I say? Verse, yes, we're third and 42. Thank you, sir. We have a sports fan in here. So, we're third and 42, and the world says it's Hail Mary. I'm here to tell you it's our Father. This is the answer, what we're about to, to go through. I hope you take notes, or I hope you get the tape. I just dated myself <laughs> while rewatching online because I'm going to show you the playbook to get into the Holy of Holies, which is the end zone for every category of your life. And if you recognize it and you understand it and you memorize it and you have it in your head, what happens is you can audit your life. Everybody say audit. audit. It's something that we don't do. When was the last time you and your spouse sat down and say, okay, let's audit every category of our family right now? Kids, one at a time, let's audit. How are we raising Johnny? How are we raising Cindy? Are we being too favorable to, to Ralph? I don't know, Ralph. I had an uncle named Ralph. What about our finances? What about the direction that we're going spiritually? How is our prayer life doing? Like literally create the categories. Me and my wife, uh, a few weeks ago, we did a weekend trip. It was her birthday and we decided to turn it into a marriage retreat. How fun was that? We got a little A-frame chalet out in the middle of nowhere, right out on a creek. It was super cool. And uh, we got there, and come to find out when the owners watches us online, we didn't know that. It was kind of neat. We got to pray with them. But we had, I had this, I created this audit system where we had three categories that we had to do. And it took hours and hours for us to do these categories. We had to write down, uh, do you remember all the categories, what they were? Like, what were all the things? Oh, one of them was past sins. Every single sin that you can think of that I've done against you in the last 27 years, I want you to write them down if they're relevant. So Holy Spirit brings it up, I want you to write it out because that might be something that I did years ago that I may need to repent again of. How many know that sometimes you've got to repent more than one time? Because, the, you know, to God, repent once. But humans, like, sometimes we hold on to things, and we might have to repair that again. And so we did that, and then we did uh, another category, and then the last category was, was, was what can I do differently to not make the same mistakes again yesterday, okay? And so we created a playbook, and it was absolutely amazing. It was healing. Some of them were like, wow, I thought we were over that. I had no idea that it was kind of still in your, any husband ever feel like that, right? Like, 
How many times we got to deal with this situation, right? How many times do I got to say I'm sorry? And her answer is, until I feel like you mean it. That's how many times you're going to have to do it, right? <laughs> and so, you know, it was healing. It was beautiful. and It was amazing. But we need to start auditing our life in everything that we do. If you want to just be a slave, it's the easiest thing in the world. You walk into your prison. You do what the guard, the enemy tells you to do. You just do it. Or you just go along life. You know how you know you're a slave? You just go along with life with no plan. You will be a slave. The one who has a plan will be successful. So if you're not successful in an area of your life, write this down. If I'm not successful in an area of my life, I am a slave in that area. If I'm not successful in an area in my life, I am a slave in that area. And so you want to find out, how do I get out of becoming a slave in that area? So we're going to turn to uh, Exodus chapter 25. All that was too much introduction. <clears throat> and this is the instructions that God gave Moses on how to build him a house. And so one day I was praying, <clears throat> and I was reading this, and I'm like, wait a minute. I'm a, I'm a template guy. I'm a pattern guy. It's what, it's what I do. I'm kind of autistic in that area. I look for the scriptures uh, that, and all the patterns that I can find that connect them like arcs. And one of the thoughts that I had was anything that God does, he's sending a message. What's the message that he's sending? If he's, sending him, if he's telling Moses, this is how I want you to build my house, and we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and he lives in us, this must be how we build our house. So perhaps the instructions on how to build the tabernacle is actually the instructions on how to build our tabernacle, and maybe the protocols that he's about to say on how to build everything in detail, there might be some connections that are there that would teach us how to build our tabernacle and be successful in our house so that he can live inside of us. Amen? So we're going to go in order. Start with me in verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they may bring me an offering. From everyone who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. Incredibly, the very first thing that Moses tells, excuse me, God tells Moses to do is I want you to have them bring me an offering. Now that's fascinating to me. Like there's a million and a half things that God could have said was step one, and he hit right between the eyes where nobody wants to talk about, which is I want you to bring me an offering. Now, why would God, we're going to play some interactive here, why would the very first thing, he didn't say go pray, he didn't say here's the blueprints for the temple, or here's how to build the Ark of the Covenant, he said the very first thing I want you to do is have them bring me an offering, and then he qualifies it from those who are willingly from their heart. So it's got to be a heartfelt, excited, from the inside offering. Why? And we're not going any further, I want to know why. Why? was the very first thing that God required to build him a house was they had to give an offering from their heart. Why? What's that? Crush their ego. Okay. What else? A need for supply. So there's a practicality for it. Okay, that's fantastic. I love it when people don't give me spiritual things because that, that's spiritual in itself. There's a practical level to offerings. What happens if there's no offering taken for this congregation? There's no supplies. Okay, we just have paper plates. Don't cost a lot, but someone gave so that you could eat. Okay, so practicality. What else? Participation. Participation. What do you mean by that? That's really good. Give me more. Okay, can I, can I help you and say the word partner? Okay, participation. So there's an invitation that God wants to partner with you. Love that. That's good. What else? What's that? Oh, right now we don't know. We're just trying to get in the mind of God. And don't cheat and read forward. <laughs> but what, what's going on? Well, the, the principle is the offering. So, so what else? Somebody had something over here. Okay. When you make an investment into something, it means more to you. Anybody else? Cost? What do you mean? If it doesn't cost you anything, then you're not invested, right? You're, 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 you're not going to be part of that. Those are all fantastic. Listen, the reality is, is that God is asking for something that he doesn't need. Does God need an offering? He owns what? Everything. Everything. The cattle on a thousand hills. 
the banks on a thousand corners. What does he not own? Like it says in Job, what are you going to give me that I don't already have? By the mere fact, listen, this is really deep what I'm about to say. If we feel like there is anything that God needs, that means that God has a lack and he's not God. God is already whole within himself. So you must get over, especially in American Christianity, which we've burned, been burned by this right here, okay? But we've got to get over the idea that we're giving an offering for God. Does God need a house? No. What's happening with the tabernacle then? Why is he, why is he asking them to build a tabernacle? Save you time and I'll tell you why. Because he once lived on this earth and walked freely. But when man sinned, they polluted the opportunity for God to be able to, to polluted the land. So therefore, God was required by his own holiness to withdraw. God cannot come to this earth without a place that is clean and holy. The tabernacle was a garden of Eden experience. It was the end of the umbilical cord from the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of earth. That tabernacle was the only place on earth where the Holy Spirit could come and dwell and it be inside of kingdom authority jurisdiction. It was holy, clean, and set apart. Therefore, that's why he called it Kadosh. That's why he had to build it. But God didn't need it. God didn't even need to come to this earth, but he wanted to reestablish his kingdom. And you know how he did it? If you are like me and you're autistic and you think of everything that's in, in channels and categories and, and protocols, the only way that God came back to this earth was he had to have somebody give an offering that told him, I want you here. Do you get what I'm saying? The entire palace of God, the castle house, the tabernacle, the mishkan, whatever you want to call it, that it's called in, in the scriptures. God wanted to start out by saying, if you give willingly, then I know you want me. Can you imagine out of the two million people that came out of Egypt, there were some that had no idea where they were in the plan of history. None. They had no idea that Moses was going to be Moses. Korah had no idea he was going to go down in history. These players didn't know who they were. They were just playing in their own history, which was his story. Can you imagine being someone where you, you're, you're, you chose not to give? You didn't believe. Can you imagine being in the heavens right now? Or, or, or in Sheol, waiting to be resurrected, and going, man, we could have gave our golden earrings to be part of the Ark of the Covenant. They didn't know what they missed because God doesn't reveal everything at one time. This is why, gentlemen, back there, thank you for saying, what were we giving for? That's the whole point. God says, do you believe? Then give. And here he said, now, if you have the heart to give, come forward. Now that you're in my circle, he's looking for team players, by the way. Those that are on the team, they don't care what they got to give. They just believe in the vision. They're like, man, we want the creator back on this earth. And if this is how we're going to do it, I'm in. I don't have much to give, but I can give. And he says, okay, now here's what I need. Now we can read forward. Verse 3, and this is the offering which you have taken. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet thread for linen and goat's hair, ram skids dyed red, badger skins, acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointed oil and sweet incense, onyx stones, stones to be set in the ephod, the breastplate, let them be for my sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show you, that's what? In the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all its furnishings, so you shall make it. By default, if it's a pattern, that means something exists somewhere. It's already there. So it's in the pattern that I will show you, in the Shemaim, in the heavens up above, there is a tabernacle, all of these things. So he's saying, I want you to make a list. Here's what I want you to do. And you know, some smart aleck Israelites, like, he just asked for badger skins. Where in the world are we going to find a badger, right? Or how are we, gonna, what's this all about? He gave them the ingredients, said, this is what we need. They already agreed to the vision, and everyone went out and did his own part. 
because of the heart was to willingly, with his heart, give the offering for the vision and let God handle the rest. What God is doing, first thing he does before he does a movement of God, he will filter. That's what he does. He filters. He is going to qualify the called because not all the called are qualified. How many know, I believe it's in number 16, when he gave the instructions to go into the land of Canaan, and he said, I want you to, uh, I'm going to give it all to you, right? How many know that God said, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan? And in the same doggone chapter, they create 12 spies to go spy it out. Like, what in the world are you doing? Like, he just said he's going to give it to you. And read carefully, and he said, because I'm testing the hearts of the men. Let them go. go. Mo, let them go. We're going to test their hearts and find out what happened. What's he doing? It's an interview. Sent, he sent them across, let the giants, let them see the giants. God said, come on, angels, back away. Let the giants come. I want them to see the giants. I need them to go through the interview process to see who's on my team. Any good movement of God, any good revival, anything that is worth its weight in anything will always start with the interview process. Recognize that. And let me tell you when the interview process starts, now. Everyone is in an interview all the time. If you constantly find yourself uh, repeating the same uh, uh, triggers, the same mistakes, the same quagmire that you're in, it's because you're failing your interview and God loves you so much that he just puts you right back through kindergarten. Some of you are 50-year-old kindergartners. Professional colors. Here's the amazing part. Listen to this. God says, I want you to give forth an offering. Here's all the things. Here's the scarlet thread, the fine linen. They have no idea. All of this is for them. All of it. Every single thing that they're giving, he's going to fashion, because we already established 101, God doesn't need it. He's going to have these people and the artisans create the Ark of the Covenant, create the tabernacle, create the curtain with the linen and all these things, and he's going to recreate Eden for them. It's not so that God doesn't have a place in the universe, so he's like, I, look, I, got, I, I need a, like a Holiday Inn Express, guys. I need you to build me one, a studio. He doesn't need it. He built it so that we, he can establish relationship with us. So everything that we give, and by the way, if you think I'm talking about money, you've been really polluted by the traditional church. Look past this. This is a lifestyle, ladies and gentlemen, that when you, if you, want, when you give to your spouse, when you give to your children, when you give time, when you give up your right to be right, it's for you. It's not for them because you're God to everyone around you. You are the priest and king of your home. So if you are a good God, little g, if you're a good Lord, if you're a good king, then you're constantly giving. You're constantly giving. And in, in the giving, you're creating the presence of God for yourself as well as them. This is why you can never outgive God because he multiplies it. And the closest one that does this on earth is a woman. You cannot outgive a woman. Now, generically, like there's probably some that, that are not very good givers, maybe because of their past, whatever. But generically across the board, you give a woman an ingredient, she creates a meal. You give her, her your seed, she creates a child. You give her furniture, she creates a home. And also, if you give her frustration, she'll give you hell. <laughs> they know how to multiply. They know how to do it. They know how to, I can't take credit for that. I saw that on Instagram and made me laugh so hard. <laughs> Except his list was like 20 long and it was like so serious. And then I'm like, but that's so true, right? They multiply it they're, because they're, they're, they're feminine and, and ruach in Hebrew is a feminine, uh, okay, uh, word. Holy Spirit multiplies. So when you give of yourself, you multiply. What did Yeshua say? When he laid his life down, what happened three days later? He multiplied. I must go away because what? Or if I don't go away, the comforter can't come. They're going to kill me. The devil's going to kill me. He's going to salivate and feel good about it. And then what's going to happen is it's just going to multiply me everywhere. Everywhere I can go, anywhere at all times. The concept of real giving is recognizing that you're building the kingdom of God and it's for you. 
Somebody say amen. 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 All right. Skip down to verse 10. Then they shall make an ark of acacia wood, inside and out. It should be pure gold. Verse 16, and you shall put it in the ark of testimony, which I give you. Now, this is a word that's not used very much at all today. But I want to tell you that the number one thing that, that is inside of your home after you really, really, which is why I spend so much time on giving, because we are so good at what? Taking. Okay? Like, like, you know what drew you to your spouse, gentlemen? You know what, what, what your wife really liked about you early on? It's like you opened the door. You gave her, right? You brought her flowers, right? You did these things. You're giving, 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 giving. And then you get married, and you're like, cut her head off, put it on a wall, mount her up there with my dear heads. Right? I've conquered that castle. You stop giving. It's giving. It's giving. Giving is what created the presence that you liked in your life and in your marriage. Don't be given to everybody else and not give to the people that you love the most. You wanna repair everything? Give. Yeshua gave himself up. For Christ so loved the world that he's something, I can't remember the next word. What was it? Gave. gave, yes, thank you. He gave his only begotten son. He gave away. And even with God, when he gave his only begotten son, It was for his best interest. It all came back to him. You give the linen, God creates a curtain that will bring you right into the Holy of Holies. But watch this. Verse 16, the Ark of the Covenant is actually called the testimony. Check this out. You shall, the blood of the lamb and what? The word of your testimony. If you're in biblical language and context, the way that that is really read is you shall overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of the ark of the covenant that's in you. That's what it means. The word of the ark of the covenant that's in you. What's inside the ark of the covenant? The 10 commandments represents the authority, represents the Torah, represents the instructions that God gives us. God says in, in, in 1 John 5, 3, you can't you love God unless you keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So there is an instruction manual. There's a Torah. There's, there's something to do for God to bless him. Then there's also the pot of manna. We call it the jar of manna, but it really was a pot of manna. And that manna is the bread from heaven. It's the rhema word of God that never ends. It never goes bad. It never rots. This is the goal. Get into the Holy of Holies. And then there is the rod that buds, a rod of Aaron that budded. It was an almond tree. I could spend an entire message on each one of these things. That almond tree was the tree of life. How do we know that? Because that's what the menorah was. It was actually an almond tree, seven branch menorah representing the seven spirits of God, which connects to Revelation and the seven churches of God that are all prophetic in itself. And they had a bowl and a a blossom and a a flower, a bowl and a blossom and and a, um, what is it? The third thing. I can't remember off the top of my head. The three things. Each one of those three things are on The branches and the center stem, all of those add up to 66 pieces of the menorah, which represents the word of God. Ironically, we have 66 books of the Bible. And if you add them up and put the Old Testament as the center, so you take the center of the menorah with these three, which is 27, 27 and 12 is 39. On the left-hand side of, of the menorah, we have 39 pieces, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. God knew what he was doing. It's incredible. So you have a testimony in your life. What is your testimony? What's the first four letters of testimony? No, it's T-E-S-T. I said letters, not word, right? (laughs) Got to pay attention. It is, it's a test. So what is your test? We talked about interview. If you want the Ark of the Covenant to be in your life, you must have those three things. You must have instruction. You must be in the rhema word of God. This is something that this movement is horrible at because they're stuck in the holy place. See, we're going in reverse, by the way. So the holy place, starting the holy of holies, now we're in the holy place. The holy place has what? The table of showbread. The priests make this bread. The priests, I would be uh, symbolically in that position where I'm making bread for you right now. I'm giving you bread. I'm I'm, I'm, uh, exegetically espousing the word of God to you. I'm feeding you the bread of life. But that is not where you're supposed to stay. 
Because you're supposed to be able to feed yourself the word of God. And that happens in the holy of holies. It's called the rhema word of God. The rhema word of God is that instant. Have you ever had like a, a word from God? It's a, maybe a preacher is preaching and all of a sudden like he says the word banana. It means nothing. But to you, you got all, got all emotional about it because last night you had a dream about bananas. I don't even know why I'm saying this. I, I'm horrible at analogy sometimes. But, but you know what I'm saying? Like the preacher said something and now it just struck you. And the Holy Spirit said, this is what I want you to listen to right here. Not a single person in the congregation understood anything else about a banana, but you got it. That's called the rhema word of God. You live in that prophetic spiritual place where you are always waiting for God to speak to you through everything all the time. For Jim Staley, you might judge me for this, but I, the word of God that's found inside this iPad right now is the literally the last place that God speaks to me is through the actual written word. Now, part of that is because, you know, all glory to him, I know it so well and have read it so many times. It's in my heart. It's written on my heart. I don't need to go and read chapters and chapters and chapters a day. I've read it so many times in so many places. It's so in here. And we are on into the Holy of Holies where now he pulls from the table of showbread and the written word. But I'm getting more prophetic stuff than I am on the written word. That's where we're supposed to go. That's the game plan. That's where we ultimately want to be is I'm at a stop sign and I look over or, or I'll give you a better example. I'm at the NRB and I meet a lady that I ministered to a year ago and I really want to talk to this television producer, but there's five people in line. I can't never talk to her. And I look over, my wife says, hey, that, that's that person. And, and I go over and just say hi. And she doesn't even know I want to talk to this person. And she just says, hey, why don't you talk to her? I'm like, how did you know I wanted to talk to her? There's like five people in line. I felt horrible. She's like, you talk to her first. I would have never talked to this lady without ministering to this other lady, or to that lady, yeah, a year earlier. And I picked up a prophetic thing that God said, I'm making a way for you. Pay attention. This lady didn't know you wanted to talk to her. I put it on her heart, probably spoke through her with something she didn't even know she was saying. And the point of me telling you this is you got to pay attention everywhere you go. You should be listening for God Amen. all the time. Most of us don't do this. So we're not successful in our walk with God because God, let me tell you something right now. He never stops speaking. Period. Ever. Period. We stop listening because we've been trained with religious circles, especially if you come into the front of the book. People train you to read, the read, the read, read, read the word and dissect it and get in all the languages. Like, like whoa, you're, you're just zooming in, zooming in, and zooming in, and zooming in. And so far, you're on to atomic level and you've lost sight of reality, but never learning all at the same time. And that's why God says, man, I, I, PFT 1.0, I was a teacher. If you, if you, did anybody uh, follow our ministry and PFT 1.0, right? Okay, so you know, I never did this, ever. You would never see me preach without a PowerPoint, ever. My comfort level was in my understanding of the word of God from an academic level. And then I got in, and, I went, and God put me into this, in this prison system unjustly, but that's okay, God's a just God, so unjust to the world. God doesn't care. He uses pagan governments for all kinds of righteous things, right? All of Israel uh, under Nehemiah right? Used a pagan king to rebuild the city. So I'll never forget this. I go into prison and I'm at a camp and I meet this guy. How do I meet this guy? I'm over at the tennis courts and, uh, which I know sounds weird for a prison, but it was a camp. It was like adult daycare. It's like being in high school and you can't leave. And there, I hear this guy singing a hymn, this black guy singing a hymn. Like it was so loud, the pipes this guy had. I'm like, and it was a spiritual hymn. So I'm like, I gotta go meet this guy. So I meet this guy, it was his first day on the compound. We became good friends. I led him into, into Torah, into a deeper understanding of, of scripture. But this guy came out of the occult. So he was used to astral projecting. He had a, a private demon, uh, the whole nine. Like uh, on levels that most of us could not even comprehend, uh, he, could, he could summon a demon instantaneously with just rubbing his fingers together with a high level of concentration. And, and, he, and he was instantly at his beck and call. And he had this prophetic ability. It was a prophecy gift is really what it was, but the enemy had hijacked it. How many knows that happens, right? Yeah. Satan goes after the prophets because he sees auras or colors. It's for real. 
And, uh, and so the, the people that have a color blue in the prophetic realm, they hijack them. So they'll end up in bars, they'll end up alcoholics, uh, cocaine addicts, or they end up in the occult because they, those are the most dangerous. You kill the prophets of God, right? That's the ones that are dangerous. And, uh, and so he was telling me after he got saved and everything, he said, Pastor Jim, he's like, I don't understand. He's like, you know the word of God better than anybody I've ever met in my life, but you don't know the rhema word of God. You don't, you don't hear his voice. Like, he said, I want you to preach. He's like, I'm going to give you a verse. I want you to preach on it. He would just randomly give me a verse. I'm like, okay, give me, I'll come back tomorrow. Let me give you a PowerPoint on it. He goes, no, no, no. I want you to preach on this verse. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. As much, it was so frustrating to feel like you had a ministry that was, you know, g global and growing and 10,000 people watching live every week and you're nothing. You're living out of the locker. Nobody knows who you are. I got five people around me that I'm trying to do a Bible study with. And then this guy can expound on the scriptures without any knowledge of it from a rhema perspective. So every night after 10 o'clock count, we would go back out to a little desk by the officer's station and he would open up the Bible and he would just like practice. I would practice. And it was embarrassing. Like, I'm so glad nobody saw me. Like, <laughs> the Jim Staley teacher could not preach on a, any verse anywhere. I could just scroll, 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 scroll. Stop. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. Right now, I could do it. I couldn't do it before because I was looking from a literal perspective. You understand? I'm feeding from the showbread. Never been in the Holy of Holies. Never been in that place where God, look, demons channel people. You understand that? Have you ever been in a position where you, maybe you've heard a demon? I have, where a demon took over a guy's voice. His name was Alan. The, the demon's name was Alan. He spoke through this young man, channeled him. Have you ever thought, maybe that's what God's supposed to do with us? Maybe we should get to a place where Holy Spirit could channel you and you're done and you don't even know what you just said. But you blew somebody's wig back, as we said in prison all the time, and you pulled them off their square because you spoke right into their heart and nobody knew it. They knew you didn't know it. So they bow before the living creator because you didn't come with persuasive speech but demonstration of the power of the love of God. And when you demonstrate power, other powers bow. This is super important, you guys. You gotta have a testimony. It's gotta be surrounded by the rhema word of God. You need to feed on the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean speak in tongues, but tongues is real. I did a teaching on it. You can read, you can watch it online, disagree with it. I dare you to try. And I'll tell you something, at the very end of it, I actually speak in tongues. I had no plan on doing it. It was so awkward. I'm in my studio, there's no one there. It's a camera and I'm speaking in tongues. But the Holy Spirit said, there's no way to teach this without demonstrating it. So I did. I, start, I ended the, 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 the broadcast praying in the Spirit. Some of you, that disagrees with your theology. I'm sorry. But that day, we, uh, when it went live, we had somebody email us from uh, South America. It was a daughter, actually, from California that said, my mom heard you in Spanish. Now, here's the cool part. She didn't know I was speaking in tongues. So when she was talking to her mom, she's, she said, mom, how do you know what Pastor Jim said? You don't speak English. She goes, well, he wasn't speaking English. He was speaking Spanish. And she said, Mom, he doesn't know Spanish. She said, well, daughter, I'm telling you, he was speaking Spanish, and this is what he said. Same day, we get an email from another uh, guy who said, look, prophetically, I feel like you were speaking Polish, but I, I, I don't speak Polish. I have no idea. Same day, we get an email from Poland. Somebody heard me in Polish. Tongues is alive and well. It's a heavenly language. Let me tell you how, how well alive it is. In the occult, they speak it. It's a heavenly language. Where do you think the fallen angels get it from? Why are they training their witches and warlocks to speak in tongues in the demonic realm? Because it's a language, ladies and gentlemen, from heaven, and they're still using it today. A warlock will tell you, I go into a trance, I speak in, they literally call it tongues. I speak in tongues, and the demon arrives. 
Hallelujah, because I can't tell you how many times I've spoken in tongues and an angel arise from God. More divine revelation I've ever had in my life is from praying in the Spirit. I'm, why am I saying this? I impress it upon you. Paul says, look, I, I, I wish that all you spoke in tongues. I wish you prophesy more. But he literally says, I wish you all spoke in tongues. I'm telling you right now, I can pray for hours in the Spirit and, 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 until it stops. And God will literally just stop it. I don't know, I'm done, I'm done. And then miraculous things will happen. Revelations, divine appointments, solutions to problems. Other problems just melt away. I don't need a solution. I've just been focusing on the wrong thing. Focus on the light, not the darkness. I don't see the darkness. That's rhema word stuff. That's holy, holy stuff. Now, I know it's been abused. I get it. But God's bringing back the real stuff. Anytime something, I'm telling you right now, anytime that you're suspicious of something, this is for someone out there, if you're suspicious or suspect of something, it's probably real. Because the enemy always hijacks something authentic. He doesn't hijack something that's not threatening. Hear me? All right. Next, we got in verse 17, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Verse 19, one cherub on one end, another cherub on the end, other end. You shall make the cherubim of the two ends of it in one piece with the mercy seat. What's this saying? This is incredible. If you know your Bibles in bare sheet, where do we find this cherubim? Huh? No, 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 no. In Genesis, Garden of Eden. What, and what's the cherubim doing? Guarding the gates. Holy smokes, what is woven into the curtain that separates the holy place from the holy of holies? The cherubim. The cherubim. What did I tell you? I wasn't making this up. This tabernacle is a replication of the Garden of Eden. It's a prophetic foreshadowing type. This is why he's putting the cherubim on the outside, separating nobody. Go, you go past that cherubim in the Garden of Eden, that flaming sword, he's like, man, I hate to do this, but off with your head, it's over with, Alice. In, the new, in, in, in this covenant, with, with Moshe, he puts the Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies, that's in Eden. The cherubim are woven into that curtain, not on accident. You better know what that cherubim represents and you better have the right credentials when you scan your card because if you go behind that curtain and you didn't pass go <laughs> properly you're going to jail and it's called death on the outside the cherubim are guardians that's what they do they're guards they are standing at attention catch this because this is going to be cool this is for someone their guards, their attention, they will kill you with their sword and they will say, with shalom, you're not coming past me. But then you go on the inside and we've got two cherub, no swords, on their knees, heads bowed, not guarding like they are called to do. What's going on? There is a message here of success and a protocol that if we understand it will deepen every single walk that you will ever have husbands listen very carefully you are called to guard the hearts of your wife and children you are called to be the stalwart british guards but when you're in the holy of holies and you want that full intimate connection with the people around you you are on your knees, head bowed, and you are one with the other cherub, with his, with the, which is your spouse, and your eyes are on one single thing. What is it? The mercy seat. The only thing that your eyes are on is mercy. When I was getting my master's in theology, I read this book called The Compassion of Christ. I hated it. It was horrible, like it was so difficult. It was a thin book, but it was, every page took like four hours because it would be like, find this verse, the blank, but not tell you the reference. So I'm in prison, no phone, no concordance, and I gotta find this scripture so I can fill in the blanks. It was mind blowing how difficult it was. And they did it on purpose 
Because if you don't have a digital way to do it, you got to look for it yourself. You're going to know where it's at. You know what I mean? After you do that. And I discovered after I, after I finished that book, the most difficult book to get my master's was this. 85% of the miracles that Yeshua did, it literally says in the text, because he had compassion on the people. It's compassion. Compassion, 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 compassion. And the point of that course was to teach as a shepherd of your home, of a congregation, a leader, your number one attribute is not this. Your number one attribute is this. It's when someone wrongs you and you choose to pardon them. You choose to have compassion. How to remember the, the movie Schindler's List, one of the most disturbing movies ever made, but very, very powerful of, of, of killing the Jews. And the German was up there and Schindler was up there on the balcony of this, of this slave camp. And he's shooting Jews as they walk across the camp, just shooting them in the head just for target practice. And Schindler was really having a hard time keeping his emotions under control, but he was trying to influence this, this general and teach him what true power was. And he's like, General, no, no, you, you, he's like, look at all the power I have. He's like, that's not power. He's like, power is when you have the authority to do it and you choose not to. And he's like, let me tell you what real power is. And he explained it, and then the general, like, it, it made sense to him. So he put his scope, and he goes, I pardon you. I pardon. And the people that were going to be killed had no idea that they were being pardoned. See, real power, real authority is not exercising your authority when you have the authority to exercise it. You choose compassion. You choose mercy. At the moment that you do that, it's one of the attributes for getting into the Holy of Holies is you've chosen mercy. You cannot choose judgment. There's no judgment seat in the Holy of Holies. Isn't that incredible? This is the throne of the living God. And by the way, uh, this Ark of the Covenant thing, uh, it, 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 it was not unique to the, the Israelite culture. Like everyone had thrones for their gods, but they had the, 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 the statue of their God on that throne. For the God Yahweh, this was his seat. And in every other culture, in every other God, it was called the judgment seat. This is unbelievable if you catch this. Everyone, even inside the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the first century, it was called the judgment seat for the head of the Sanhedrin in the Caiaphas position of the high priest. It's the judgment seat. The Romans had the judgment seat. But the creator of the universe had a mercy seat. Wow. It emotionally touches me that what Pastor John said earlier, that what God chooses to do is pardon you. He chooses to not give judgment as long as you are qualified to be in his presence. And none of us are qualified to be in his presence. Which is why you start out, and this is where we go from here, we start out at the altar. After your offering, you end up at the altar, and we talked about this last night. You offer your sacrifice, yourself. The blood has got to be shed. And you plead the blood of Christ. And it's after that that you get mikvah. The priest got mikvah one time. Guess where they actually got mikvah from? The brazen laver. The brazen laver, the priest got mikvah one time from the water of the brazen laver. By the time that Solomon built it, it was seven and a half foot deep. It was a sea. They called it a sea. And had, I think, ten of them. After you get mikvah one time, initiated into, the, into uh, priesthood, Every day, they were required to go back to the brazen labor to wash their hands and their feet. What you do, where you go, it matters. What you do, where you go, it matters. You have to go back to that brazen labor and wash in the water of the word daily. This tells us prophetically that, that your hands get dirty every day. Unintentionally, they become unclean. Your feet become unclean. Spiritually, we need to make sure that we are walking the right way and we are mikveing our hands and our feet. We are immersing ourselves in the water of the water, excuse me, the water of the word of God every single day. 
you're going to get unclean and you won't know it. And I'm here to tell you that most people don't do two things. It's absolutely incredible. I, as a matter of fact, I want you to name the three things that, how many of you grew up in church? Raise your hand. Okay, here's your test. Name the three things. Uh, who is the, the, the guy that does uh, Family Feud? Yeah, Steve Harvey, but well, the guy before that, the original guy. Okay, so yeah. So we're going to do Family Feud. Top three, we asked survey says, what are the top three things that every Christian needs to do? Pray, number one. Ding, 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 ding. It's up there. Number two, read your Bible. Ding, 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 ding. Three, go to church. Is it up there? Ding, 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 ding. All right, middle section wins. Give yourself a round of applause. All right, now here's the great part. How good are we at the first two? Pray and read our Bibles. We don't do it. Let me tell you why. Have you always wondered why it's so doggone difficult to read your Bible and pray? One, because you've not been in the Holy of Holies to when you read the Word of God, it, it, it flies off the page like God himself highlighted certain things for you for that particular day. Because if you wake up and you're in the Holy of Holies and you've learned to live in the Spirit of God, and I open my Bible, this is what I see straight from God. Nothing but highlights. I'll read it, and I'll read it like this, and I teach my kids to do this. Don't read your Bibles to read your Bibles. I'll be the only preacher on earth to tell you to don't read your Bible. But I want you to read it in the rhema word atmosphere. So you're going to read it. Your, so, so before you read it, you're going to go, God, okay, here's the deal. I, I, I don't want to just read the, the static. I don't have time to understand all of the details of the culture and context. I can do that through a video or doing this or read a book over here. But right now I need a word from you. So when I read this, I want to have a relationship with you. I want you to show me what I need to hear. And I promise you and I give you my word that, Lord, if you keep your end of the deal and you highlight something for me, I will bow like the cherub on the mercy seat and I will obey. This is how you read your Bibles. And I'm telling you, God hears those prayers, and he answers them every time. And so you will read the word, and you'll read it with great expectation. Great expectations. What I say at the very beginning, God gave me a word uh, for the whole year 2024. What was it? Be intentional. So intentionality, not ritual. It's different. When I get into the Word of God, I'm not doing it because I'm a believer in Jesus. I'm going to read the Word of God. No, I'm going to be intentional, and I'm going to ask and believe with great expectation that every single time I open this, I'm not stopping until he pops something out. And then I get convicted. Oh, my goodness, that's what he's doing. That's what he's saying. And you'll always know it because, honestly, he'll highlight something that has nothing to do with the context at all. If I expository, if I did a, 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 an, a, an exegetical sermon from that of what God showed me, everybody would say, Pastor Jim has lost his mind, take his master's degree away. He doesn't know anything about the Bible. That's because it's the rhema word of God. It was for me. You get enough of that, you'll be in your Bible every day. Number two, prayer. The reason why we don't pray is because we're not in covenant. Ouch. Muslims will be in covenant three times a day, never miss. I was in prison talking to a friend of mine. His name was T. And it was a big guy. He was Muslim. In the middle of talking, like, and my, my nickname was Preacher. I know it's a shock. But uh, he said, Preacher, I got to stop you for a second. I got to go pray. And he took like four steps over to his cube, grabbed his little carpet, put it on the ground, started praying to Allah. You can say what you want. Deep respect from the preacher. He was teaching me something. His God came first. So we don't pray for two reasons. Number one, we don't understand covenant, and it's part of the covenant, and you can't be in covenant without doing it because we don't move the material through the material. We move mountains through prayer. The physical in this world does not get moved from pre only from practical YouTube videos on how to have a better marriage, how to have a better you know, husband, how to raise better kids, how to be more successful in your, in your company, whatever. The world is moved by the hand of God. 
And if we understood that, that the only time that God moves is when you pray, because he said, I want you to start off with an offering, and the offering has to, means that you have to give up and die, and you have to get on your knees. Something's got to be shed, and it's you. He's, look, even in the New Testament, he says, when you come before me uh, with an offering, and you remember that your brother sinned against you, what does he say? Go to talk to your brother. And that's where, we, that's where every preacher on the planet focuses on is the relationship between your neighbor. Everyone skips over the obvious. And what is that, John? That you're at the altar. That this believer has an idea that he's required to make an offering to his God. Nobody preaches that. The main subject of that scripture, it is a default covenant requirement of every believer to come before God without being empty-handed. You better have something to give God. And he doesn't need it. We just established it's for you. That's why he says, I'm not taking your offering, which means you don't get a blessing until you go make things right with your brother. But the subject of that whole context is you got to go before God with an offering. There's so much in this. There's just no way to go through all this. Holy Spirit, thank you. Cherubs, mercy seat. We need to have mercy. The table, look at this. He said, you shall also make a table, verse 23. Jump down to 29. You shall make its dishes, its pan, its pitchers, its bowls for pouring. You shall make them a pure goat, and you shall set showbread on the table before me always. What's he doing? This is not a temple. Ladies and gentlemen, he told me, if I said, make me a table, bring some dishes, some silverware, and put some bread on it, what did I just describe? Dinner. God wants to sup with you. This is a relationship. This is a living room. Holy of Holies is, is bedroom. Hol holy place is living room. He wants to have dinner with you. This is a God of relationship. He's the only God that had a mercy seat, and he's the only God that gave instructions that said, this is how you can be blessed. This is how you can be cursed. All other gods never told them anything. They had to guess constantly. He wants to have relationship with you. This is a dinner table. So much to go into that I'm not, though. Is anybody getting anything out of this? I want every single, listen, right now, if, if your answer was no and you didn't say anything, I want you to pray right now. Matter of fact, close your eyes right now because I don't want anybody leaving. God, in Yeshua's name, if there's someone out here that has not received something that would practically impact their life, I pray that you would give them in the last few minutes here the rhema word for them, that they would walk out of here not empty-handed, but encouraged and challenged to go farther and faster and wider with you in Yeshua's name. Amen? Okay. So first, you make an offering. Second, you have a sacrifice. You're giving up of yourself. You say, I am not a slave. What's your next phrase? See, that's why we're called children of God, right? <laughs> say, I am not a slave. I choose to love. Okay, see how well we forget? And I even had you do it three times, okay? Say it again. I am not a slave. I choose to love. Okay, so we make that sacrifice. I'm not a slave. I choose to love. I put my flesh on the altar. Then I get mikvahed like the priest. I'm going back. And next thing I know, I find myself in the holy place. In the holy place, I turn to my left. There is the original representation of the tree of life. That is the menorah. Whether you knew it or not, know it now. Super cool. It's not Jewish. It's a representation of where we should have been all along. It's the tree of life. It's the seven spirits of God, seven characteristics of God. So much in, in that message alone. You look to the right. There's the dinner table. So now we've got the chandelier. we got the dinner table. And right here, we have the altar of incense. So we take the word of God daily. We're being washed by the word of God daily. We're being filled with the light of God daily. And now we want to go further. But there's one requirement. You can't pass the cherub without the high priest, and you can't go in there without something else. Does anybody know? Blood. Very good. It's not what I was thinking, but assuming you already have the blood, you got the high priest with you, there's another item in the holy place we haven't talked about. It's the altar of incense. And now I come up to the altar of incense, which is about this size right here, and I come up to the altar of incense, and I'm ready to go in, and I got a problem. Because you get so close, and all of a sudden you end up back out at the altar in the dirt. 
and you are face down, and you're like, man, I was just here. This was like a year and a half ago. How did I get back to this very place? Does anybody ever feel like that, that you're like going around your journey, and then all of a sudden you're like, how in the world did I end up back here? I thought I left this place. If you understood the protocol, if you understood the steps of holiness to get into the holy of holies, you would understand that this is exactly where you're supposed to be. You didn't go backwards. You qualified to go all the way back to the altar to get the coal. Ladies and gentlemen, you didn't go backwards. You're not at the same place. Because by the time that you put your, your altar sacrifice there and you came and you moved yourself all the way to the place where your desire was to go further and farther and wider and go past the curtain into the Holy of Holies, God said, now is the place and now is the time your heart is qualified. This is going to hurt, Jim. Your ministry is going to leave, leave. Your best friends are going to slander you. Everything's going to be against you. People are going to believe the government. All these things are going to come against you, but you don't know what you did was qualified to go get the coal. I want to take you further. And now by the time I get back to the sacrifice, it's gone. My flesh is burned. He crushed me in the process of the journey from there to here. The flesh is the whole burnt offering is gone, and now I can take the coal. You see, what I was trying to do was cheat because I didn't know any better. Put the sacrifice. Okay, God, let's go. I grab the coal while the sacrifice is still, you know, the, the goat is still making noise. And God says, you can't do that. The coal can never be taken until the burnt offering is complete. When you are gone, you will qualify to come in with me because the flesh can't come in that holy of holies, ladies and gentlemen. It's spirit. It's deep calls to deep. You hear what I'm saying? The spirit of God will kill you if he sees flesh. I'm spitting everywhere like Gallagher in the front row, right? <laughs> God is looking for spirit men to rise up in the flesh to be destroyed. And the only way to do that is to send you back out there and make sure that that flesh is dead. Then he will give you the censer and you can take the coal. Here I am. Ladies and gentlemen, Isaiah says, take the coal. Cleanse my lips. This is covenant, temple, holy of holy language. He understands that the coal is designed to be placed here. This prophetically tells us that that altar of incense, ha ha, and the book of Revelation tells us what? It is the incense of what? It's your prayers of the saints. Which, what did you pray with? Your mouth, which is why Isaiah says, I'm taking that coal and I'm putting it here because this is the real altar of incense. So when your Bibles, when you grew up, God used your Baptist preacher, your Catholic priest, whatever they were, to teach you right. Because the first thing you should be doing is on your knees and praying, read your Bible, and then stay in fellowship. And it's those very things that we actually don't do. And so we never hardly make it into the holy place, much less the holy of holies. Because the altar of incense requires death, it requires sacrifice, it requires your entire flesh to be destroyed, and then it requires you to take that coal, come in, and put it on your lips, and that means you got to say something before the Almighty God, and it better be good or his cloud doesn't show up. Meaning better be good doesn't mean articulate and flowerly. It means that you it better come from a pure heart. What did he say? Very first, we'll end with this because we started with this. He said, I want an offering, not just any offering. John, what kind of offering did he say? Of one with a pure, willing heart. Husbands, your, your wives don't give a rip if you take out the trash. If you do it with a bad attitude because all of us are children. Do you let your kids get away with that? Obedience, but sassafras at the same time, that doesn't work in my house. I've got one of those. She's 11, and she's a faster talker than I am and a better attorney. She wins most court cases in my house at 11. 
But listen, when we get down to wanting to get in the Holy of Holies, you better take that coal and you better put it on your lips and you be able to begin to pray, pray, and pray, and pray in the Spirit, and pray the rhema, and pray what God wants you to pray. And sometimes you might be praying and you don't even know why you're praying, but you're praying for this. And God is, having, is healing you over here for that. Because you think literally... If I pray for this, then God, I'm waiting for an answer for this because we're Greek. But the moment you pray, you stepped outside of time. So you entered into the realm of the Holy One. And when you pray, God doesn't even care what you're praying for because the moment you pray, you have connected the umbilical cord from heaven and the life that's in the blood comes into your life and begins to heal everything around you and you won't even know how it happened. Because you may not get the answer for this. God, I just really need this $10,000 to get out of debt. And someone knocks on your door and asks you to be their business partner. And you're like, no, stop. I need $10,000. And they're like, I'm giving you 50% ownership in my billion-dollar company. Hold the big God, but do you have $10,000? We don't understand how God works. You pray for your wife for seven days straight like I did at 4, 30, 5, 30 in the morning for hours, and you're just praying for her, and you don't even know why because she's already perfect, but you're praying, and you're praying, and you're praying because God said, I want you to pray, and then seven days later, I'm the one that's been changed. But I, th I thought I was perfect. I didn't need any changing. She's an angel. She got one thing I don't like. I'm going to spend seven days praying for it. I'm determined the living God will honor my prayers. She will not burn my bacon in Jesus' name. I'm tired of burnt bacon. <laughs> Got my wife. My wife loves burnt bacon. <laughs> Right, But look, at the end of the day, I'm praying for this, and God's healing me, changing me. A total different mentality, not even looking at life the same. Because God is not concerned about the detail of your prayer as much as you get in covenant prayer. How do I know that? Because wives, I'm going to set you up with a t-ball amen right now. And if you don't say amen, I'm expelling you from this congregation. <laughs> wives do not care. If I've learned anything in 27 years of being married and 31 years of knowing this woman, my wife is not concerned about all the details of what I do when I'm around her. She just wants me to be present when I'm with her. Did I miss it? Because that was not every woman in this place here. Or maybe some of you are so controlled by your husbands, you're scared out of your mind to say amen. I don't know. We can have deliverance for that if you need to. Just raise your hand. Praise God. We're almost finished here. As you get the coal and you put it to your lips and you make a covenant prayer, and I challenge you, I'm fixing to do this on, on an international level with everybody that's, that follows our ministry in multiple languages. God is pushing this global planet. It's not just me. God inspired me from another pastor, so I'm passing it on from the Holy Spirit. But we've got to start getting on our knees and being the cherub that moves into compassion and mercy and start travailing in the Spirit in prayer and outdo the Muslims or the Muslim gods are going to outdo ours. And so I'm going to challenge you to ask God, what is your sacrifice? I said last night, pick it, make it specific, and write it down. And don't put it anywhere on your digital area. Write it on a piece of paper. Put it in lipstick on your mirror. I don't care what you do, but you need to write it down because God showed us prophetically that it has to be written down. He wrote it down on paper, on stone, vellum. He expects us to see it. Make the covenant in stone of whatever your sacrifice is. And then secondly, I encourage you, because I may not ever see you again, you may not ever see the message that I'm gonna do here shortly, but I want you to make a covenant prayer and ask God, what is it for and how long is it supposed to be? And if you don't hear an answer, because maybe you're not used to hearing the word of God or, or the spirit of God or the reign of God, you guess, he'll be okay with whatever you choose. For me, God never told me, but I just did seven days and I, I chose 5.30 in the morning, why? Because 5.30 in the morning is about when I go to the bathroom and go right back to bed. Mornings are not my thing. I'm an evening guy. You can text me at 1 a.m. I'll probably be up working. But at 5.30, nada. 
5.30 is not okay with me. So you know what happened? I would set this, this, this covenant prayer thing. I set my alarm. Never once did I wake up at 5.30. My alarm never went off. Not one time. Holy Spirit woke me up 4 o'clock, 4.30. I'm like, God, you said 5.30. Why are you waking me up at 4 o'clock? And by the second day, I had so much out of it, I couldn't wait to get out of bed. My eyes would open up at 4.30, like, like almost like the old days in Christmas morning. I'm like, I can't go to bed now. It's 4.30. In an hour, it's going to be 5.30. And I would get out of bed, and instead of one hour, two hours, it would be three hours of prayer, man. And God changed my life in seven days. What would he have done with 21? And so I'm challenging you today. Some of you can do 30. Some of you can do seven. Maybe it's only three. Some of you can do a 40-day fast of just prayer. Maybe it's 15 minutes for you. Maybe it's 30. It, easy, it's easy for me. I'm a talker, so I can just sit and talk to God all day long. Whatever it is, I'm telling you, the answers to all of your life questions is prayer. But understand the covenant, the, the covenant level of what we're talking about. For me, part of my covenant if I'm one minute late, I got to start all over. Seven more days. I'm super surprised God didn't let me be late just to trick me into doing another seven days. The power of prayer is beyond what you can imagine. And I'll end with this story that inspired me to tell you what I just told you. And just so I know, how many have, 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 have ever heard of Pastor James Kowalia and saw that video? Like seven million views worldwide a former African warlock that got saved and how it happened is extraordinary. And I'll give you the 60-second the version. But he was called into a, a celebrity meeting of the highest levels of warlocks in the world and they were talking about territories that they were taking in the spirit. When was the last time we, we saw pastors of leaders? Hey, John, we're going to have a conference of how many territories that we've taken for God. This is what they do. And these demons were given prophetic information. And they said, look, there is 20 women and a, and a young pastor in this country in Africa. And they started a 90-day prayer covenant. And they're on, day, uh, they're on day 40. And we have had to pull our people out 21 miles cir circumference around this village because the anointing is so strong that everyone we have sent in to hijack them has either been killed or converted. Get this. The demons told these warlocks, this is so serious that if, if they get to day 90, none of these people, by the way, had a clue that they were making an impact. And by the way, the demons also said that these 20 ladies and this single young pastor on day 40 unlocked 7,000 churches worldwide and put them back into revival. And none of these churches had a clue it was coming from these 20 women and this pastor. But the demons were telling their stewards, this is the seriousness of this covenant prayer. They said, if they get to 90 days, we will be locked out of this territory in the spirit realm for 70 years. Now, were they praying, hey, God, we just pray you'd lock these demons out for 70 years? No. But the demons understood covenant prayer. They understood that God was honoring something that doesn't happen very often, that someone would say, and by the way, their covenant was nobody else was allowed in, that they didn't know, and they had to go 90 days, and if someone was one minute late, they had to start the 90 days over. You don't want to be that guy. So they spent $800,000, if I remember the, 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 the numbers right, 300000 on something else. In 500000 they said, hey, James, we want you to go in there. You're our number one uh, guy. You can do this. And so they had done all this research for 15 generations for each person in that church. They had a book for each person to try to find their weaknesses and patterns. These demons have strategy. These warlocks on the other side, they know how to take down covenants. They're going to find your weaknesses. So if you ever wonder why, like you keep repeating this, because there are real spiritual principalities in high places that know your weaknesses generations back, and that's what they prey on. So they sent him in there, and they didn't want to make it look obvious. So they paid this woman a lot of money, bought her a brand new car, make her look rich, brought her in here, and they found out through the pastor's weakness was money. Go figure. He was poor, poor, super poor for generations. So they figured this could be something that we could get him in. And this woman bought her way into the, per into the church as she begins to buying people this and funding this company here and this and that. Now everybody likes her because everybody likes people with money. And next thing you know, they invite her to be part of the prayer covenant. 
And I think it was on the 88th day. They broke the covenant. And then he ends up meeting a 19-year-old, and, and you'll have to watch that video online. I'm not going to tell you the end of it. It's absolutely phenomenal. But the point of that story was this, is that the power of prayer is beyond what we understand. I use the word beyond literally. It's beyond a realm that we understand. But what's crazy is the real high-level people in witchcraft understand it. They have all-night prayer meetings to their demons. I teach 25 to 30 pastors in India every single Wednesday night. Once a month, they have an all-night prayer meeting, and I get so convicted. What in the world? That doesn't happen in America. All-night prayer meeting? Can you believe I felt so dumb? I texted him one time after like a year I've been hearing this. I finally got the guts. I'm like, what do you guys do? He's like, we pray. That's why we call it an all-night prayer meeting. Heart, 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 heart. I'm like, well, okay. Praise God. We pray all night. I challenge you to call your family to an all-night prayer meeting. Mine's coming. Kids, you're not allowed to bring your pillows. We're going to have an all-night prayer meeting. I want to get into the power of the living God, and that happens first, by the way. No, 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 listen. Your prayers are not the power. The power is in the willing heart of your sacrifice. The power is not in the prayer. The power is in the one that's offering the prayer, which is why your whole journey starts at the altar. It starts at the sacrifice. It starts at the offering. It starts with getting holiness. You're never going to get holier than, than, than thou, but we are called to be holy as thou. Make sense? Stand with me, please. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, God wants to take you into the holy of holies. If you're here with, with someone that you love, would you just hold their hand right now? I want you to be the cherubim. In, the, in your own Ark of the Covenant. No matter where you're at, even if there's a gap between you, even if you had an argument this morning, it doesn't matter. Let it go and let God do what he wants to do right now. Father, I just come before you in the name of your son and I just thank you, Abba, for the power of the protocol of the priest. Thank you for taking us into the Holy Holies, but teaching us how to do it. Thank you for helping us understand that there are times and there are seasons where we seemingly get kicked out of your presence, but it's only so that we can be deeper by going back to the altar, making sure our flesh is consumed and grabbing the coal. Abba, most of us go back to the altar and we don't have a clue what we're doing. And so we just repeat the same thing. When you said you wanted a sacrifice of praise, God, you're not looking for us to just sing a bunch of words. It is awesome worship to lay down our life, God. Lay down our right to be right and live our life for someone else. Lord, will you help me to live my, my life for my bride and my children? Help me to be the crucified savior for them. And Lord, I pray for every man in, 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 in the presence of my voice. Married or not, doesn't matter. God, that they would learn the process of sacrifice, of giving, the offering of praise, prayer, reading of your rhema word. Teach us, God, the depth of who you are. Show us how to get into your presence in a deeper way. We love you. We honor you. This weekend is not over. We ask for your Holy Spirit, Ruach, Rhema word to fall upon us today and move us into a direction of sitting on your lap in the mercy seat. We thank you, God, that it's not a, a seat of judgment. We thank you that it's mercy. Will you give us a spirit of mercy for others? We love you and we praise you. 
everyone sin. Amen. Thank you. Amen.